let's picture the front of a public library. It's this giant stone building, plain, gray, safe. You would hardly expect that it houses almost every kind of creativity possible. Out front, gathered, there's about 15 rough-looking teens, and they unpack an arsenal of spray paint. They begin to work, collectively and independently, to transform this massive concrete wall into a masterfully executed work of art. It's not vandalism, it's graffiti, and it's the work of the Die Active Art Collective of Thunder Bay. So when I was in high school, I wanted to consume every possible art medium and technique, and it was kind of hard to grow in that way when what seemed like all that was available were art classes I couldn't afford, and I don't know, high school art rooms that you don't always want to hang out in. So I had to do my own thing. A group of friends and I would get together. We would organize punk rock shows. We would teach each other how to silkscreen t-shirts. We would just make art books together. And we didn't know that what we were doing at the time could be labeled. Youth-led cultural production. And I certainly didn't know that it would become my life's passion and my career. So let's think for a second about your earliest encounter with arts and culture or just an early one. Maybe you, maybe it's the first concert you went to. Maybe you heard your dad practicing drums. Something like that. Think of something that moved you or changed you. And now, think about a time where you felt that creative. So it could just be that somebody asked you to draw bubble letters for them, or you performed in a piano recital, or maybe you danced in a powwow. That sense of pride and self-worth that you got, that's what I want to talk about. There's something so surreal having to defend arts and culture. There's an inherent value to arts and culture. It is life-enhancing. It helps to define our personal and our national identities. And although we lose sight of it, arts and culture is important to us all. I'm an artist, happily born and raised in Thunder Bay, and my experiences in the arts as a teen especially, more like lack of experiences, is what led me to the Die Active Art Collective. So the original concept was, let's just get free art workshops to youth in Thunder Bay. And I have to pause on that word youth. It's sticky and oppressive. It gets caught on my tongue. It just brings up this mountain of stereotypes that young people cannot relate to. Youth, young, youth are lost. Youth are irresponsible and incapable. So we needed to rebrand this word. We called ourselves the young-blooded, the ages 14 to 30-ish. Just called ourselves emerging artists. And we chose the name Diactive because we knew we wanted to do a lot with our time before we died. So it is now a community of over 600 emerging artists making it the largest art collective in Canada. And it's here. <laughs> okay, so how, how did we die active? How did we make this happen? We just wanted to create something that meant something to us. We looked around the city and we couldn't see ourselves reflected. We saw all these structures that someone else built and no room for our voices. So it started out small, we made zines, which are handmade publications of art and writing by the members. But Diactive quickly transformed into an art collective focused on street art with massive capabilities and impact. And this can be seen in over 40 of our completed projects, from 25 graffiti walls to professionally organized youth-led exhibitions, speaking in conferences across Canada, being published in internationally known magazines, not to mention just endless requests to paint walls, that's Waverly Library, and to run workshops. We were even given, this one's cool, a train engine in Thunder Bay and an entire alley in North Bay to paint. So, at the surface, it's this kind of fun, free arts mentorship program for youth. But it's the structure of Diactive that's unique. 
The members come up with the project ideas. They teach each other the techniques, and then they help each other to complete them. And they learn it all for free. So why is that important? First of all, keep in mind, there's no censorship, no sway over content. All of the works are the original ideas of the members. And what this translates to is you get a completely authentic and creative expression of a youth voice that was once held captive. So seven years the collective's been running, and I'm stepping back just to look and analyze beyond this surface level of arts education or arts appreciation, because the effects run much deeper. I've seen it create some of this city's most active, innovative, and fearless young leaders, and it just began as, as one-on-one -on -one encouragement. The collective now functions as a place for young people to find themselves, find out what they love about themselves. And this is why I asked you to recall the time that you felt creative. That energy that you got, it was a very real spark in you. And with the proper supports, like a high school art teacher or supportive family members, or even better, grassroots structures like this, you would have grown to an empowered and capable individual carrying that energy in you, and it's enough to change entire communities. I try, I try to describe that energy because it sounds kind of loose and weird. So I picture this white ball of light deep in my chest, and it was very small when I was a teen. When it was fed creatively, it grew. It has a hundred tiny beaming tendrils inside of it. And when you pick up the drum, or when you see your grandmother practicing traditional Japanese dance with her fans, the tendrils explode, and they bind you to your history and your identity. And your blood makes sense. Where you stand makes sense. And this feeling of awe that you have on the edge of your future, it becomes tightened and connected and you're excited to be you. So I asked some of the members, why do we need Diactive? And I'm gonna quote one right now. He joined when he was 22, having never spray painted before, and now he's one of the most highly sought after freelance artists in Thunder Bay at age 28. Boy Roland says, Thunder Bay needs Diactive. Without it, youth would leave and never come back. It gives our art a context, a place to live and grow. Members want to learn beyond group of seven. They want to know what's happening right now in Canada, and they want to be a part in shaping what it looks like 20 years from now. All in all, it just makes being an artist in a small city a lot easier. So there was this one member of Diactive, a young indigenous woman named Lucille. She came from Fort Hope when she was 15, and her counselor brought her to us, to the collective, during a mental health recovery plan. And she wouldn't stay for the workshops, she just would bring these poems for us to publish in the zine. I read her poems, and they were like nothing else I had ever read. Her stories were dark, they were about suicide and loss, and they were about traumas that never should have happened to a young girl. Diactive has this wonderful no-censorship policy, so we publish everything that's given to us. And as I held her poems, I noticed I was hesitating. How do I publish these next to stories about first love and comics about pizza? And for half a second, I considered not putting them in. And telling you that makes me feel sick. We published her poems. Her voice was not going to be silenced. And I realized that the collective is not just for healthy teens. It's for everyone who needs it. I knew that if I could just get close to Lucille, I could figure out why she doesn't get the same experience as the other members. And it took a couple years. Eventually, I found out that she has trouble relating to them, finding things in common. Her story was different, and she used art differently. 
She couldn't see herself in the room, just how we couldn't see ourselves in the city. So Diactive is successful for many reasons. It's this cool, chaotic space, one of the only places young people have complete ownership over. But for other reasons, it's unsuccessful because it was exclusionary. How are we supposed to reconcile this? I praised Lucille. I praised her work, and I encouraged her to do more. And I began to identify my own judgments. The fact that I didn't feel like poems like hers belonged, and that maybe somewhere deep inside of me I felt like she didn't belong. This revealed to me the seeds of discrimination that were somehow planted in me. Imagine yourself at age 14. Leave your hometown, leave your family, leave everyone you know, and go and try and start a new life for yourself in a new high school, in a strange city full of people who hate you. It's impossible in my mind. I would break. Understand, please understand that this is Lucille's story and the story of so many indigenous mo youth moving here. So Lucille created Michi Studio. And with the framework of Diactive and an outstanding committee of indigenous youth, we've begun to try to fill a need in this city. Over 50 indigenous youth attended the very first Nietzsche Studio workshop four years ago. nothing like Diactive, and it's the only program that I know of like it in Canada. Here's how it works. Every workshop has a young Indigenous artist sharing a culturally relevant and contemporary art practice with a packed house, all young bloods. There are no leaders, no adults, no one at the front promoting anything. We've created a safe, relaxing atmosphere where Indigenous youth can feel themselves and experience ownership and some self-governance. We didn't want it to feel anything like high school or like diactive. We wanted the youth attending to feel that it is their space. And we create that, we create this feeling by letting them run it. I thought that I thought that I knew everything about youth-led cultural production. I know how to create a fun space where arts mentorship is united seamlessly with this personal development. But with Nietzsche, I became a humbled learner and listener. Youth, we do not know what their needs are, only they do. And they are not lost. As adults, we need to always remember to be learners. We build these spaces and structures that are meant to be exciting and enticing, welcoming to youth, but we build them out of our own needs and interests. This stage, this auditorium, it is thick with barriers. And although this is where we come to hear and see arts and cultural performances that move us and change us, who's included in that us and who's excluded? When I think about it, what did it take to get me here? I was 16 and an art teacher saw something in me. The arts were validated. I wanna make sure that this keeps happening for others. 12 years working in the arts now, I've just recently realized that in some ways I've failed. With Diactive, I created another exclusionary structure. But Lucille is helping me. I would have loved to have all 300 members of Nietzsche Studio here today. They have a lot to teach us. 
we need to listen and find our patience and begin to identify, acknowledge, and work out those seeds of all forms of discrimination that we each bear. <laughs>